Church, this morning we are opening God's Word to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 4. I want to bring another special message to you this morning from one of these beautiful passages in Scripture that tells us how to have peace in hard times. How to have peace in hard times. It is strange in America right now because some people's income and their their lives have not been dramatically affected where others have had their lives absolutely turned upside down. There are now in America about 10% of the people in our nation who have lost their jobs and lost their incomes. And as we consider uh, how many people are are working for a business, a, a company, an employer, Um, which we do not know if we'll survive these hard times. As you watch your retirement dwindle, you may begin to fear. And it is understandable. I want to say to you this morning um, that I have to preach the sermon that I'm about to preach first to myself and then to you. Because your pastor is prone to worry just as you are. And yet we know that the most common command in Scripture is do not worry. Do not be afraid. It is really incredible when you think about it because the command not to worry is a command from God. And if we disobey the command do not worry, do not be afraid, do not be anxious, if we disobey that command, what do we call it when we disobey God? It's sin. Worry is a sin. Anxiety is a sin. Fearing anyone or anything other than God alone is sin. I I want you to think about that because I'm guilty of that sin just as you are. But I want you to think about how serious of a sin it is Imagine, if you will, for me, God upon His throne. And in the council of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, from eternity past, devise a plan whereby the Father, the Son, and the Spirit will glorify themselves, but namely the Son. And the Father devises an eternal plan. He decides that He will create humanity upon this earth and He will place a man and a woman, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden to live for Him, to worship Him, to glorify Him, to magnify Him, and to walk with God Himself in the cool of the day, in the midst of the garden. And in creating them, before He created them, God already knew that they would turn against Him and rebel. And in God's eternal decrees and purpose, God decided that He would use their rebellion, their sin, because that's what sin is. It is rebellion against the King of heaven and earth. God would use their rebellion against Him as an opportunity to magnify and glorify the name of Jesus Christ. And the way that this would happen was that the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, would leave His throne in heaven and live amongst wicked, sinful humanity whom He had created... As John chapter 1 says, His own did not receive Him and they did not know Him when He came to this earth. The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, and yet this world was full of darkness and lies. And Jesus came and lived a perfect sinless life that no one else in all of human history has ever lived. Jesus, the sinless one, 
lived in order to demonstrate and to fulfill the law of God and demonstrate God's righteousness. Jesus lived a perfect life. And then sinners who hated Him, who could not stand His moral purity and and His uprightness, who, who could not tolerate His righteousness, they decided we must murder Him because He exposes our wicked deeds. And so the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the crowds, they devised a plan to kill Him and the crowd shouted, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! And they took the Son of God and they nailed Him to a cross. And in that moment, Satan thought he had the victory over Jesus. And Satan thought he had the triumph as they laid Jesus in a tomb. But little did the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the crowds and Satan know, but this was all a part of God's eternal plan from the foundation of the earth. And that as they laid him in that tomb, our sins had been paid in full by the blood that he shed on that cross in our place. He paid the penalty for my sins and your sins and for all who would ever trust in Him. They laid Him in a tomb. Three days later, He burst out of that tomb. He rose from the grave. He appeared to many, over 500 men, the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15. He ascended into heaven. By His resurrection, He has secured eternal life and a a future resurrection for all who trust in Him. And He ascended into heaven back to be with His Father in heaven at His right hand. But that's not the end of the story. One day soon He will come again. And He will return in glory and splendor and power to rescue His people and establish His kingdom forever and ever and ever without end. And in all that, you say, Amen. And yet right now, you're doubting if the same God who planned all of this gospel glorious truth, you're doubting right now whether or not He can handle your mortgage, your cancer, a virus. He he could defeat Satan and the grave. And you worry that this God cannot take care of the sparrows and the lilies of the field. Think about that. And I've done the same. I'm like you. But think about what Jesus meant when He said to His disciples, Oh, ye of little faith. Do you not realize that faith the size of a mustard seed would move mountains? Understand that you're having faith in the God who created the mountains. It's not that you have the power to do it, but He has the power to do whatever He pleases and your faith and your hope and your trust are in Him. So you're telling me God can do all those things, but He can't work out the problems in your life? He ordained all things whatsoever come to pass from eternity. Isaiah 46.10 says, He declared the end before the beginning. From ancient times, things not yet come to pass. Ephesians 1.11 says, He works all things according to the counsel of His will. Romans 8.28 says, He works all things together for good, for those who love God, for those who are counted according to His purpose. And yet you think He forgot about this. You think that, that, that he, he overlooked the details of your life? He cares for the... The sparrow. But he's forgotten about the one that he created in his own image. We know better. We we need to stop our fear and our worry and our anxiety and we need to think about who he is this morning and what he has promised us, told us 
authoritatively, finally, in His Word, what He will do. Paul is writing the letter to the Philippian church from a prison cell. We know that Paul had had already broken out of prison by an angel who was sent and, and had released him from the very prison in Philippi. And so, now when they would imprison Paul in other places, they would chain him not only to the prison itself, but oftentimes to one of the Roman jailers so that if the guard fell asleep and Paul tried to run away, he'd have to drag the guard with him because they were doing whatever they could to try to keep this man in chains because he served and worshipped a God who was greater than the chains that these men had placed on him. But it was God's sovereign purpose and plan that Paul would be in this prison cell writing many of the letters in the New Testament that we're reading today, including the letter to the Philippian church. So here Paul is in chains. What is his crime? Why is he in prison? Because he wouldn't stop preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because men hated Jesus and they hate His righteousness and they hate His decrees and they hate His laws. And Paul kept preaching Jesus no matter what this world did to him. And it landed Paul in prison and from his prison cell chained to a big, ugly, smelly Roman guard next to him, Paul gets quill and paper and he writes these words in Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice! Rejoice in the Lord always! Again, I will say, rejoice! Let your reasonableness be Be known to everyone, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. These are such incredibly powerful words. How they speak to our situation right now and every time in our lives when we are tempted to fear and worry, which, yes, is an incredibly serious sin against God. Paul says here, rejoice in the Lord always. Now he tells us, he he commands us. This isn't a suggestion, this is an order from God in His Word. Rejoice in the Lord, take joy, take delight in the Lord Himself. And do it always. Why does he say always? Because there are times in your life when things get hard that you will want to stop rejoicing in the Lord. So Paul and the Word of God say, always rejoice in the Lord. Don't give yourself an excuse to stop praising God and thinking about who He is and all that He has done. Rejoice in the Lord always. And because he knows how thick-headed we are, he says again, because you probably missed it the first time, again I will say, rejoice. Now Paul repeats himself for a reason. It's just like when parents have to repeat themselves for their children. Why do you have to repeat things 
for your children because they didn't listen the first time, right? So why does God repeat in His Word for us to rejoice in the Lord always? Again, I will say rejoice. He says it again because we don't always listen the first time. The first thing you need to do is you need to set your heart on God and find your joy in Him. That is what it means to rejoice in the Lord. Verse 5 says, Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. This word reasonableness, it could also be well translated gentleness, kindness. This word gentleness, reasonableness, kindness, it... It speaks of someone who becomes frustrated and flies off the handle. Now, I know you've never done that, but I have. Have you ever become so frustrated at what's going on that you just lose your cool? Men, have you ever worked on an automobile before? Have you ever been working on something in your house and you're trying to fix it and you break it even worse than it was to begin with? And you become frustrated and angry. Reasonableness is the opposite of that. This is not losing your cool. Not letting the frustration of the circumstances get the best of you. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. That is, in the way you live your life, you don't have a license to fly off the handle. You don't get to excuse your bad behavior. It is not acceptable. It is forgivable. Jesus did pay for it on the cross, but you don't get to keep doing it. You can't excuse it. That kind of of, of short fuse is not okay. You can't just say, well, I have anger problems. No, you have a sin problem. And Jesus can fix it. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. I love how in the midst of talking about how we become frustrated in this life and lose our cool and do foolish things, Paul says, don't forget Jesus is coming back soon. I look at this and I go, thank you, Lord. It really doesn't matter if I got in a fender bender and messed up the side of my new car. It, it really doesn't matter these little things in my life that are bothering me so much right now because one day very soon Jesus is coming back and I will not care what my car looks like. I can't take it with me. What Paul is saying is Jesus is at hand and when He shows up, the only thing that will matter are the things that are eternal. And nothing else is going to be of value when Jesus shows up. All the money in your bank account and in your retirement account will be worthless in a moment. Now that's not to say that in the meantime you shouldn't save. You should just realize that that is only of use and value in a small way for a short time. But what really has value is storing up treasures in heaven, not on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but storing up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. The, the Lord is at hand and when He comes back, all of the things that you've been worrying about on this earth that really do not matter, they will vanish in a moment. They will be gone. This world will dissolve like snow, Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3. It's coming to an end. It's passing away. So be reasonable. Be gentle. Be kind. Don't, don't allow yourself to get frustrated with things that really don't matter that much to begin with. Whatever your health problems are, they will vanish when Jesus returns. 
you will be healed forever. You won't have to go to the doctor ever again unless your doctor is in heaven with you and then you can worship at the feet of Jesus with Him there. The Lord is at hand. He's coming back. Eternity is ahead of you. Don't forget that, beloved. Verse 6. Do not... Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. He says here, do not be anxious about anything. Once again, that's a command. The, the word anxious, it's a word that, that literally means to be torn apart by fear and worry. The idea is of something that's ripping you apart on the insides. When you think of anxiety, what, what is it? Anxiety is, that, is that, that, that mental, emotional, physical state which causes you to, to become so worried that it begins to affect your physiological well-being. You, you begin to have headaches and blurred vision and tightness in your stomach and cramps in your muscles and you begin to sweat and you can't sleep at night and you're constantly worried with fear. You have anxiety. You, you can't put yourself at ease. You, you can't rest. The, the emotions have taken control of you. And God commands you not to do this. And you say, well, I can't help my anxiety. Well, I just have a question for you. Then why in the world does the Bible say don't do it if you can't help but do it? It seems to me that there is, in fact, a way to escape your anxiety. Otherwise, why would God command you not to be anxious if you can't help but be anxious? Now, in your flesh, yes, you cannot help but be anxious. You cannot overcome your anxiety on your own. That is true. You are powerless against your anxiety if you are trusting in your flesh, of course. But that's true of every sin. We're commanded not to be anxious here about anything. Even the things that you would excuse as an opportunity to be anxious. The things that you say, well, I mean, but I, I can't help but worry about this. No. Paul says, no, not even those things. Not even your job, not even your retirement account, not even your cancer, not, not even the, the son or the daughter that, 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 that you're constantly worried about, the friend, the brother, the sister, not even those things are you allowed to be anxious about. Don't be anxious about anything. You're not allowed to do that. Why? Because God's on His throne. And when you become anxious, you're saying, I don't really believe that God's in control. And He is. And if you doubt His sovereignty, you are robbing Him of the glory that you are supposed to give Him in praise. Do not be anxious about anything. Okay, so how in the world am I supposed to escape my anxiety, Paul? Because I can't help myself sometimes. Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me give you the answer. It's in the second half of verse 6. Here's how you do it. But in everything. Notice, don't be anxious about anything. And now in everything. Never do this. Always do this. In everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Now here he says, in everything that is, regardless of what happens, good or bad, whatever is going on in your life, no matter the circumstance, in everything by prayer, we know what prayer is, go to God, call out to Him. But now he's going to tell us two essential components of prayer which must always go together. The first component is the one that we tend to be good at, supplication. 
what does supplication mean? It's, it's pleading. It's, it's, it's telling God all of your problems. Lord, this is wrong. That is wrong. I need your help. Please change this, God. Please do this for me. God, I need you to do this. I need you to change this. God, I'm desperate. I don't know what to do. That's supplication. And Paul says you should do that. That's the, the first of two critically essential components of prayer. But notice the second. Plead with God, make your supplication with thanksgiving. God, I have these problems, and I know you're on your throne. And God, you've been so good to me in the past. I mean, I know there are a lot of things that are wrong, but there's a lot of things that are right. My sin is paid for. Jesus is not still in that tomb. You have blessed me with countless blessings. And if I were to name them all, I could not name them for the next decade of my life. There are too many. I would forget the blessings that you've poured out on me. And God, because you've been so good to me, and my faith is weak, and I, I've been worried, and I'm sorry, Lord, and I confess it to you. Would you help me with this thing in my life? Because God, I need you to strengthen me and to help me through. That's how you pray. What Paul is saying here is give your supplication, let God know your problems, but do it with thanksgiving. In other words, don't make your prayer time a pity party where you rehearse all of the things that are wrong and say amen and walk away as if all you have to give God is your complaints. There is no complaint department in heaven. You, you are not to come to God with all your grievances and walk away. It doesn't work in your marriage. It doesn't work with your children. It doesn't work at your job. And it won't work with your Creator. Give thanks to Him, for He is good. His love does endure forever, and you know it. You know that it's true. That's not to minimize your problems. That's not to say that there are not things in your life that are seriously wrong. But it is to say that you have even more to thank Him for. And so if you spend all your time complaining and no time in thanksgiving, then you are robbing God of the praise and glory that are due His name. And why would you expect Him to give you blessings if He knows that you're not going to thank Him for it when He does? By saying supplication and thanksgiving, Paul is assuming that every one of us have things in our life that are wrong and things that are right. Things that are bad and things that are good. Right? He doesn't say some of you only have thanksgiving because you lucky folks, you don't have any problems. No, no. Every one of us should make supplications and bring our problems to God. And every one of us has things to be thankful for. And we should be thanking God in prayer. Let your requests be made known to God. Tell Him what you need. And in His grace and His mercy, He will answer. It may not be exactly the way you would answer, but that's because His answer will be even better than your answer. If you did it your way, it wouldn't be as good. It wouldn't be as glorious. It wouldn't be as wonderful. But God will always give the perfect answer. He works all things together for good. For those who love Him, for those who are the called according to His purpose. Verse 7. If you do this, if you will pray in this way, making your problems and your blessings known to God, if you will pray in this way, 
There is a promise in verse 7. And this is an inviolable promise. It will happen if you will do what the Bible says in verse 6. The promise of verse 7 will come to pass in your life. You may not have the promise of verse 7 because you haven't done what was prescribed in verse 6. But if you would do what God says in verse 6, the promise of verse 7 will come to pass in your life. Listen to what it says in verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say maybe, might, could, if you're lucky... It says the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will. Will. It's a fact. It's certainty. It's sure. And God does not lie. And if you say that verse 7 is wrong, then you're calling God a liar because He said if you would make your prayers and supplications with thanksgiving and let your requests be made known to God, then the peace of God will rule in your heart. If the peace of God's not ruling in your heart, it's because you're not doing what He said to do in verse 6. Now notice what the blessing is in verse 7. It is the peace of God. Peace is the opposite of war and strife. Your emotions are warring within you. You are striving with yourself and with others. And if you would make your prayers known to God and give thanks to Him at the same time, He will give you peace. He he will say to your heart like He said to the, the waters, Peace, be still. And in a moment, the waters stop roaring. And He can do the same thing for you. Because Jesus, who created the Sea of Galilee and stilled it when the disciples disciples were afraid in the boat, is the same God of heaven and earth who created your heart. And He can still your heart in a moment. The peace of God. And and listen how Paul describes the peace of God. It is that peace which surpasses all understanding. You see what Paul's doing here, right? Paul is saying that God will not necessarily give you the answer to the question, why? He will not tell you why this has happened, at least not this side of eternity. He's not promised to give you all the reasons for all the things that have ever happened in your life. But He does promise to tell you what to do and how to do it. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. You know what you need? You don't need the answer to the question why. You need the answer to the question, what do you want me to do, God? And how am I supposed to do it? And He promises to give you answers to that. He will tell you what to do and how to do it if you would just ask Him. He will grant you your spirit. You are weak, you are fallen, you are frail in your sin. No, you cannot handle your problems on your own, but He can. And if you would call out to Him, He would grant you the strength and the peace that you need to know what to do and how to do it for His glory. The peace of God surpasses. It's better than all understanding. More than you need to know why, you need to know what to do and how to do it. And stop asking God the question, why? Because when you ask the question, why did you allow this to happen? You're saying, God, I'm not sure you're as good as you say you are. God, I need to question you. Because I think I know better than you. You shouldn't have allowed this thing to happen, God. Who do you think you are? I'm smarter than you are. I know better than you do, Lord. That's what the question, why, is asking. Why did you allow it to happen? Because you shouldn't have. And how do you know? 
Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? God asked Job. When Job asked the question why, God said, Job, you're not God. You don't need to know why. But I have my reasons and they are good. The Bible says the judge of all the earth will do what is right. That is a blanket promise for all of time and eternity. God always does what is right. And if you think it's not right, you're wrong. He always does what is right. Just because you don't know why doesn't mean there isn't an answer to the reason why. You just need to know what He expects you to do and how and with what strength He expects you to do it in. He will give you His Spirit and He will enable enable and empower you to do it. The peace of God, which is better, it surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Your heart is racing, your mind is racing. You don't know what to do and you don't know how to do it. But Paul says God's God's peace will guard your heart and your mind because your heart worries and your mind questions and you need to stop that and God will guard your heart and your mind so that you will stop it. Notice, you don't guard your own heart, your own mind. God does that with the peace that He gives you. He will guard your heart. He will guide your mind in Christ Jesus. This only comes through Jesus. It doesn't come from the world. It doesn't come from worldly counselors. It doesn't come from your friend or your neighbor down the street. It comes from Jesus Himself. Stop listening to those who would counsel you differently than Jesus does in His Word. You need to go to the Word of God and see what He has to say. God, what should I do and how should I do it? And He will answer. Verse 8. Finally. Finally, brothers. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellent, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Now, I could preach a whole sermon on verse 8. I'll just briefly sum up what it says. Part of the reason why you have so much anxiety is because you were looking at and thinking about things which are ungodly. And because you're focused on the things of this world, you can't focus on Jesus. It is one of the causes of your anxiety. So Paul says... These are the things that you need to be thinking about. Things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, and excellent. And if you would think about things that fall into these eight categories, then your anxiety would begin to dissipate. Because you don't become anxious by thinking about things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, or worthy of praise. No, when you're thinking about those things, your heart rejoices in God. When do you begin to worry? When you begin to look at the evil of this world and the things around you, and you begin to fear and be afraid of other people and things in this world that can hurt you rather than fearing God alone and knowing that you're in His hand. A big cause of your anxiety and your constant worry is because you're thinking about things other than God Himself and the things that He has given you which are so beautiful. If you would focus on heavenly things, it would do a world of good to calm your heart and your fears. But if you keep filling your mind and your heart with junk, then don't be surprised when your mind and your heart acts like you've filled it with junk. Fill your mind and your heart with that which is good from God Himself and your mind and your heart will be much healthier. Verse 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. When I read Paul say things like imitate me as I imitate Christ or here in verse 9, what you have learned, received, heard, and seen in me practice, I think to myself, man, I wish I could say that to other people. I wish I could be that kind of example. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't, I don't know if I want to say that 
But then I think about it, and, okay, you may not be the pastor of a church, but do you have children or grandchildren? Do you have a husband or a wife? Do you have people who look up to you? They're imitating you whether you know it or not, whether you realize it or not, the things that they are learning and receiving and hearing and seeing in you, they are doing. You're influencing them. And so when I read this, I think, man, I don't want to tell others to learn, receive, hear, and see in me and then do those things. And yet, it's already happening. My children are watching me every day. The members of my church are watching me every day. My wife is watching me every day. My friends, my co-workers, my neighbors, they're watching me every day. And I'm influencing them. And if you think you can do something and it won't affect others, you're fooling yourself. What you need to do is you need to surround yourself with godly people. And you need to learn, receive, hear, and see in them the things that you ought to be doing. In other words, who are you keeping company with? Who are you allowing to influence you? Not only who are you influencing, but who are you being influenced by? Surround yourself with people who would be a good example like the Apostle Paul was to others so that you could practice the things that you've learned, received, heard, and seen in them. And then if you would do that, stop thinking about garbage, stop surrounding yourself with garbage. And I'm not calling the people that, but their behavior is exactly that. And if you would do this, the God of peace will be with you. First, Paul said the peace of God will be with you. Now Paul says, the God of peace will be with you. Verse 7, you'll have the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Verse 9, practice these things. And not only will the peace of God be with you, but the God of peace will be with you. And if He's with you, you can stop worrying. Is He with you? Do you really know Him? If you do, then why are you worrying? And if He's not with you, are you ready to have Him? Are you ready to confess your sins and call out upon Him and ask Him to change you and free you from your sin and save you? Do these things... And the God of peace will be with you. Let's pray. Father, I come this morning in the name of your Son, Jesus, and Lord, how I need to obey your words here and how I have often disobeyed them, Lord. Forgive me. I am no different, no better than the people that I've preached to today. God, you are the God of peace. The one who gives the peace of God. The one who doesn't always give me understanding, but who does tell me what to do and how to do it and gives me the strength to do it by your Holy Spirit. God, let me trust in you and stop being afraid. And I pray the same for all who are hearing me today. God, forgive us. Forgive us for our doubt and fear. It is a serious offense to your sovereign rule as the King of heaven and earth. God, forgive us for doubting you. We've all done it. We're all guilty and we all need your grace. But the blood that your Son Jesus said is sufficient. It is paid for our sins. It is nailed to the cross and Jesus is risen from the grave, secured eternal life for those who trust in Him, and He's coming again. And Lord, we ask for Your grace, we ask for Your goodness, we ask for Your strength, and we ask for Jesus to come again soon. And Lord, until that day comes, strengthen us that we would be useful to You. Lord, help us to not worry in hard times. Help us to trust in the God who is 
greater than our problems. That you would receive all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.